Well, hello there and welcome to an update on our geologic unrest going on in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is January 5th, about noon here, Mountain Standard Time, 7 p.m. over there in Iceland. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate your time and for watching these videos as we sort of view this geologic episode unfold together in, in real time. Uh, so there's no eruption that's taken place yet, but we do have some GPS data that shows us that some of that uplift we've been looking at has resumed beneath the Svartsengi power plant. But we're also going to do a deeper dive today on some of the other GPS stations in the area and try to get a more comprehensive, complete picture about what's going on there in the subsurface. Um, and we'll see that there's slower uplift in some areas. Uh, other areas don't seem to be showing much at all. And then in some instances, we even see much more rapid uplift over the past few weeks. So let's jump right into the data. Oh, and by the way, at the end, what we'll also do is um, address some of the questions and answers. I apologize yesterday during the drone live stream. Uh, I didn't know we were going to have to end early, but we needed to because Nature Eye was running the live stream and they had other flights that they had lined up. And so I do apologize that um, I had promised to do a question and answer. And then in the end, I was only able to do a few questions and then I had to end that live stream. So I've copied some of those questions from yesterday's live stream, pasted them into a document today, and I want to address those so you feel like those were uh, actually acknowledged. So let's jump in with the earthquake data. So this is our last 24 hours, and we can see two dominant clusters of seismic activity. We've got this cluster of earthquakes off to the east here, uh, just west of Klevervatn, this lake in this area over here. And these are, of course, aftershocks related to those two larger quakes that I think was a 4.3 and a 3.9 that we had a few days ago. So these are just aftershocks from that seismic event. And so we're seeing these are dominantly small earthquakes, ones and below. Um, I don't think there's even a two on the map. Anything above a two? No, so nothing bigger than a two, at least over the last 24 hours. So that explains that little cluster there. And again, we think that what we're seeing so far, these quakes are not related to any magma influx or movement of magma in the subsurface. So for right now, um, the best the best hypothesis is these are tectonic quakes that quakes that have been generated by the the stress conditions in the area caused by the eruption and the magma intrusion. And there's all these different factors that I explained in the last update that might be triggering these faults that are that exist in this region. And then, of course, our other cluster of earthquakes is back over here along the area we've been focusing on the past few weeks, this northeast southwest trend uh, running from just north of Grindavik uh, up into this area here right along the old Sinux Giga crater system. And these are all small quakes as well. So while these are still occurring, um, they're all ones and below. So small magnitude quakes um, going on there. So the seismic activity is not hugely helpful right now. Um, but what we're looking for here is a quick ramping up of quakes in terms of frequency and possibly intensity that might indicate an eruption. But also remember that because we've already established this plumbing system, because we had that December 18, December 18th eruption, that, that that conduit, that that pathway for the magma has already been established. And if the magma takes that pathway again, because that pathway is filled with um, semi-molten weak, semi-molten magma that's weak uh, and easy to move through without breaking it, uh, we might not see a whole lot of earthquake activity. So the next eruption, which feels like it could happen any day now, and I think all, all the scientists agree that any time from now to the next few weeks would be a likely eruption, also recognizing that there's a possibility of no eruption that just magma intrudes in the subsurface and doesn't have the pressure or the volume to overcome and create an eruption at the surface. Um, but really, we're expecting something anytime soon, certainly within the month. Um, I'd been thinking these first few weeks in January, we'll see what happens as we get more data coming in. So, so there's our earthquake update for the day. Looking at the Met Office, they put out two updates for today. So we'll just run through these quickly. They put out a new hazard map. And so we'll go to that here in a second. But they 
they've been putting out these hazard maps for probably the past three weeks or so. So they updated their hazard map based on the latest data uh, and information. And the big change as they uh, outlined here is that the Svartsengi area, zone one, where it is now considered to be somewhat dangerous, but it's a decrease from the last version of the map. The reason for this change is due to the formation of large cracks on the surface is considered smaller. So they're not thinking that, you know, that cracking of the ground in that region is going to happen. Um, in addition, the interpretation of scientists suggests that the Sundnuk's crater series between Stora Stogafelt and Hagafelt is the most likely source of an eruption. So thinking about where we're most likely to see that eruption taking place. So we'll give this map a quick look here. Um, make it a little bit big, smaller there so you can kind of see all the different zones. And so you see they've delineated now six zones. I think it was five before, uh, and now they're up to six different zones here. Um, so really just dropping a few of these, um, you know, the possibility of, of cracks in some areas and not in others. And then the red zone, of course, is the most likely place where the hazards exist, not just the earthquakes, but the lava. Uh, you can see the outline in gray there of the December 18th to 21st lava field. And then Grindavik is still in a somewhat elevated hazard zone because it's along that trend, along that dike that formed. Uh, it's also downhill of some of these flows if they, if they were to occur further south in the system. So, so we got the hazard update there. Um, the other thing they updated earlier, so the previous update, but still for today, January 5th, just kind of summarizing and skimming through this update. So land rise is still being measured with a similar speed as the last few days, uh, confirmed with GPS data. It's an indication that magma pressure is building up, increasing the likelihood of new magma flow and also an eruption. However, it cannot be ruled out that this is an indicate that this is an indication that it reduces magma inflow. So it's possible that we're not seeing um, much magma inflow either. You know, so we've got a couple different ways to interpret this data. Uh, number of earthquakes that were felt. And then they talk about the earthquakes off to the east, uh, those being mainly sort of tectonic quakes in general. Uh, it's still the opinion of scientists that if there is an eruption, most likely area is in the Sinux crater series between Stora Stogafell and Hagafell. Uh, it's important to recall that magma flows do not always end in eruption. So magma flows meaning an intrusion, right? That magma being pushed into the shallow subsurface region, that doesn't always culminate in a surface eruptive event. There's plenty of times you can get magma moving close to the surface and it doesn't erupt. And we saw that on November 10th uh, when it moved in off to the east and formed the dike system and the earthquakes there. And then they mentioned a few uh, other locations in Iceland where they've seen that take place. So there's our Met Office update. Um, and so remember that we've got a a pathway established that that magma chamber or sill is sitting somewhere over here. Um, its exact extent is somewhat poorly defined because we can you know the uplift can be felt some air some distance away even though you're not necessarily right over the actual magma body. Um, but we know that there's a pathway from that storage chamber, that shallow storage chamber of magma into this system here, which already now has produced an eruption at the surface and a vent. Um, and so that pathway is likely to be used again. And so um, very likely to, if we see something happen, it's going to happen more or less in this, this broad region over here. Could it happen somewhere else? Sure. Um, but playing the probability and looking at what's happened up to this point, looking at the data, this is where the greatest probability or likelihood would be is somewhere in here. Uh, might be off to the west. It could be further south near Grindavik, which was, is not what we would hope for. Could be further to the north. Um, lots of other options, but this is the most likely scenario. And the hazard map more or less reflects that. So let's do a deep dive into the GPS data. And in the past, I've just tried to keep it uh, fairly simple and not dwell on it too much by just looking at the one main GPS station, the Svartsengi power plant. Um, but maybe in doing so, I, I've, you know, presented a picture that wasn't fully complete. And so um, I've spent, I've usually looked at more of the station's data, 
but I'll admit to being lazy from time to time and just looking at what's happening at Svart Sengi. But I have over the last couple of days looked at the other GPS stations. And so I want to spend some time looking at what's happening regionally. And so let's start with this map here, which shows you the locations of a lot of these uh, GPS stations. So to orient you here, uh, we have uh, Grindavik down in this area. And this is the road up to the north. Uh, SENG, so they have four letter abbreviations for all their GPS stations, but this red one here is the Svartsengi GPS station. That's the one we've mainly been focusing on. But I'm going to show you some of these other ones, um, mainly in this area, but some a little bit further afield. We're not going to look at some of these ones way the heck out here. Although if you want to look at these, and I'll make sure I put these in a link in the video description, uh, here's where you can find the whole Here's the whole enchilada team. Um, if you want to just go nuts with this stuff, the Icelandic Institute of Earth Sciences crustal deformation page has the map that I just showed you, and then has lots of these these three graph plots. So these are three dimensional plots that we've looked at before. The top graph showing movement of the specific GPS station north or south over time. The middle one in green showing movement in an east-west direction over time and then the bottom one showing vertical motion up and down over some component of time and they're a little small to, to read I can make those a little bit bigger on this page um, but you can see the different four letter designations there so feel free to go crazy here and deep dive into these as much as you want uh, and come up with your own hypotheses and interpretations this is where it's just kind of fun to be you know a citizen scientist and and look at the data and see if you can come up with any sort of interesting trends or observations. I will caution you, however, to be careful when you're looking, especially at the up and down plots and the north-south plots, but really especially the up and down plots, the red ones here on the bottom, that you pay attention to the the y-axis, the vertical axis. The bottom axis is just time, so each little uh, each little dot, this is an eight-hour series, so this is going to provide um, GPS data points every eight hours so theoretically you'd have three data points per day um, but be careful when you're looking at that scale there and so to illustrate that a little bit I'm going to show you two to compare so let's look at this GPS station here and zoom that out a little bit uh, maybe a little bit more and because we can't quite see everything I'm going to shrink my little face down a little bit that's probably good for everyone um, but this is the station uh, Thorbjorn. So this is the prominent hill northeast of uh, Grindavik. So this is this hill right here, uh, just south of the power plant. Has some communication towers on top. Really, it's right over the action, right? Like the magma body, it's, it's as close as just about any other station to the magma body. Uh, and so if we look at the plot for this station over the past few weeks there's that december 18th eruption right so it was inflating increasing rising and then it deflated or dropped because some of that magma that was in the subsurface erupted onto the surface you're taking some of the volume that's below ground and moving it above ground so that makes sense that the land would drop a little bit if you take some air out of the balloon the balloon gets smaller and then if you look at the data over the last few days, you could say, well, like if I'm just looking at this casually, I'd say, like, well, yeah, it's inflating, but, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty slow trend. Right. Look at the slope of that line. Not super impressive. And if we look at another station. And so this is a, a new station that they just put in. So after November 10th, notice there's no data here for October and the first part of November, they put in another GPS station right at the Blue Lagoon or very close to the Blue Lagoon. And we can see here with the uplift data on this graph that you can see the data points rising quite steeply, culminating in that December 18th eruption, everything drops back down and then rises. So if we look at the last trend here, we'd say to ourselves, just looking at this again, casually, well, look at the increase here. Look at how, look at the, the sh steep slope of this this trend of data. Wow, the uplift at Blue Lagoon is so rampant. How can it be moving up so quickly compared to the hill that's nearby, which doesn't show much uplift data? 
And what you want to be careful for then is looking over here at the axes. Notice that this one, every little tick mark is 100 millimeters. So you've got maybe from the December 18th eruption to uh, about to today, you've got maybe a little over 100 millimeters of uplift there, right? Well, look at the Blue Lagoon scale. It's totally different. Every uh, tick mark here, space between each tick mark is 20 millimeters. And so, of course, it's going to show it much more steeply. And I don't have any answers as to why they don't show them all on the same scale. Um, I'm not putting the graphs together. But just take that with a grain of salt, just a note of caution that you can't draw too many conclusions off of the slope of the line until you've actually looked at the um, the scale here. Because I'm sure that if you showed this same graph, and I'm sure someone could do this and uh, dazzle us all, if you showed this one at the same scale as this one, the trend would be quite similar. So little uh, word of caution there as you're looking at these things. So let's go to first the Svartsengi one. And this is the one we've been looking at for weeks and weeks now. Again, if you're new, um, here's here's the idea. So we see nothing much happening through October. As we get into late October, we see the GPS station starting to rise, uh, rise and rise well into November. And that culminates with November 10th, when it drops quite suddenly. So we interpret this upward trend as magma inflation, magma moving closer to the surface. And then this drop here is when the magma moved into a new zone. It infiltrated fractures and rocks off to the east, forming that northeast southwest dike. Uh, and since that time, the area around the power plant has been rising. Uh, that culminates with the no December 18th eruption. And then since December 18th, we've seen it rise. But the last time I did an update with you guys a few days ago, we were mainly looking at this little trend here. Let me kind of zoom in on that just so we can see that in a little bit more detail. Uh, there we go. So here's the last little bit of the data. So if you look at this cluster of points here, uh, I mentioned my last update, it looked like it was stalling a bit or slowing down. And again, based on what we could see at that point, that was true. But since my last update, or over the last three or four days, look at look at the trend of data. It's resumed more or less the, this a similar slope to what we see back here, maybe even a little bit steeper. And so it's interesting. You know, what does it mean, right? So a few days ago, we conjectured or speculated that maybe this thing had reached its capacity. Maybe you couldn't expand the crust beneath the power plant anymore with magma influx because it was stalling at this point. Now that it's resumed that looking back now that might actually indicate you had just a little uh, pause or a hiatus in the magma influx and so it stalled a little bit and now it's resumed uh, the uplift. And so where does this uplift go? How far does this trend continue uh, before we see an eruption? Or can it continue a lot further without there being an eruption. So those are some of the, the variables and things we're thinking about. So that's the station we've been looking at. Uh, but let's look at a few other stations here. So the next few stations I'm going to show you are these two red dots here. So we just looked at this one here, this red dot, S-E-N-G. We're going to look at um, S-K-S-H and E-L-D-C, those ones as well, and see what those ones show us. And these ones, we're just going to mainly focus on the the up down plot. Uh, let's just make it small. That's probably fine. I think you can see what's going on. So similar, but notice that we don't see that little pause quite as much. There's a little bit of a hint of it in here, um, but still the uplift is continuing. And if we look at, okay, I'm going to zoom it in, I guess. If we look at the last few days, we can see that much steeper trend. And, you know, that who knows if that's sustainable, right? How, how much more can the ground uplift at this rate, um, you know, how many how many more days can it do that as the magma continues to fill in the subsurface, presumably pressurizing as it does so? What's what's that critical threshold going to be? So there's that station, uh, and if we go to the next one to the west, the Elvorp station, we see a very similar trend, although this one to me I think looks even even steeper. Like look at look at the last few data points here. That thing really starts to kick up a little bit. You can see the overall slope and trend uh, back here, but the last three or four or five days uh, of data, it's really taking an upward turn. 
Um, so interesting. So why would we be seeing more uplift in the West? Maybe it's found fracture systems over there. Again, the subsurface architecture of the rocks, the porosity, the permeability, the density. Uh, these are all somewhat unknowns. And the magma is going to exploit and take advantage of those easy pathways as much as possible. So that's pretty interesting there. And then the last one I want to show you, and you're, we won't take time to look at all these. Um, I think the last one we're going to look at is GRIV, this one right here. Um, and this one shows somewhat similar pattern of than what we saw with the other ones there. A little bit of a gap there, not sure if that's the weather. One down dropped point could be anomalous, probably not worth uh, dwelling on. But again, you can see, so uplift is still happening. If you just focus on the one station, depending on the time you look at these things, you can, you know, you can come up with a story, but it's good to look at all of the data here. And I think uh, looking at it more comprehensively, it points to uplift happening um, over this region, if not, um, you know, just not just close to the power plant, but over this region, uh, pretty much wholesale. So, um, yeah, a little bit more of a deep dive there. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, do I want to look at any more of these? Not necessarily. Um, and then just to kind of orient you to, so you've got the um, eight hour plots at the top. And then if you scroll down, so there's all sorts of plots. Uh, it does give you some at the bottom, if I remember right. Uh, where are they? Uh, I thought at the bottom there was, maybe I missed it. There's some four-hour ones. There are a couple four-hour ones in here. So if you look, let me see if I can blow that up so you can see a little bit better. Um, if you look at the top of these it'll say in parentheses four hour in this upper left corner here um, so that's a four hour one there's four hour there yeah so here's fart singy four hours so then so instead of updating the uh, the gps data every eight hours this one does it every four so you can see just a lot more dots right but still the same sort of trend um, again, be careful with your axes. Make sure you're looking at similar graphs. If you're going to compare one graph to another, always look at the axes to see if the uplift data is similar. So uh, anyway, bit of a deep dive there. Let's see what else do I have for you. A little bit of news. So the berm or wall around the power plant, uh, that construction continues. Uh, I'm, I've tried to get an update. Amanda, Joe, Doug, and did some sleuthing. Uh, but we couldn't find out exactly, at least for now, when or how far along they are on this. But they started pretty much right after New Year's. That's been about three or four days. Um, I'm not sure how long this is. It's probably a couple kilometers. I would guess it's going to take them, well, to complete the whole thing would likely take several weeks. But to get some sort of a berm or wall built along this phase one branch here, probably at least you know th in, into the early part of next week in order to get just a basic member three meter or so berm built up and then they plan to heighten it uh, across the whole area so remember what we're looking at here is a proactive structural mitigation measure so we're looking rather than waiting for the lava and the volcanic activity to come to us we're saying hey we we recognize the threat we we can see there was an eruption just to the north of us we recognize that lava flows heading south towards the town are likely, in fact, probable. And and let's see how this could work. Now, realize that this berm and wall idea, which which is a good idea, you know, but realize it's been largely untested. We don't we haven't really had a good track record, not just in Iceland, but elsewhere of these things and how effective they are. And also realize that there's going to be a lot of factors that will play into how how effective they might be. Remember, they're not trying to stop the lava. They're trying to deflect the lava or divert the lava uh, around in, into pathways that won't bring the lava into town. So the idea is not to stop it at this point or at this wall, but send it to the west, send it to the east to real estate and land that um, 
is fine for lava to go right there might be you know so there's a naval tower over here there's other things happening but we're we're trying to protect the the biggest uh, economic um, investment here which is the town and the the fishing village as well so it'll be interesting to see because it would depend on the viscosity of the lava if you had very fluid high temperature um, low viscosity lava these probably work pretty well because the lot those those lavas tend to be a lot thinner although they can inflate uh, as they slow down and stall but assuming they've got a good slope and some velocity they would probably flow away from this topographic barrier into these other areas however if you have a lava flow that's lower viscosity and it's thicker and uh, moving more sluggishly like we see with a -a lava flows those can actually build up to sometimes 10 meters or more um, and then they're sort of creating their own topography um, and they also exert a tremendous force laterally on the ground uh, and so there's the potential they could push on the berm and maybe bulldoze it a little bit I'm sure the engineers are looking at those variables but just recognize that if we do get lava flows headed for these protective walls um, they're not 100% um, you know foolproof right there's there's a possibility that those structures could be compromised but you know if you knew that there was a 70% chance they were going to be effective uh, and it only took a couple weeks to build and at whatever cost that's still probably worth it uh, to take the chance to save uh, the town the homes and the infrastructure you have there so on a related note the the two of their geologists in Iceland uh, these two gentlemen here uh, Professor Thorvaldur Thordarsson and Arman Holskudsen um, have been talking to the press and the public officials and they're advocating for putting up similar barricades or, or berms or walls whatever we're calling these things protection from lava flows in an area not in this area so that we're also concerned as we look as we wait and watch for the next eruption and we think it's going to be here the bigger picture is now we're seeing a lot of eruptive activity on this peninsula here's our last three eruptive episodes here's the one that occurred uh, a few weeks ago just before Christmas and going into the next year and 10 years and 100 years we're likely to see a lot more of these eruptions taking place in this region we also just saw that little cluster of earthquakes over here and while we don't think that it's magma that's uh, that's causing those earthquakes there's a possibility of some of these volcanic systems off to the east becoming active and their lava flows historically uh, depending on exactly where they erupt but if you get a vent opening up at the north end of these rift zones or these volcanic systems you can get lava flows headed downhill uh, towards the bigger and greater uh, Reykjavik metropolitan area now Reykjavik itself sits way out here on this peninsula so we're not worried about Reykjavik proper but what is of concern is this area here to the south the uh, Hop Northfjord area so this is the name of this town here and some of its outlying uh, communities and so you can see some of this black lava so this stuff I can't remember how old this is but it's probably less than a thousand years old and the idea here is well let's maybe start building some sort of berm or barricade like we have around Grindavik something in this area to pr protect this inf infrastructure because there's a lot of industry down here um, it's not just a residential area it's also in industrial and commercial and so there's a lot of uh, infrastructure in place that would it would be a good idea to protect and so uh, this article which I'll make sure I link in the description um, is advocating for that basically advocating for public officials to look to this area let's let's deal with Grindavik first that's the imminent threat that's happening right now but let's also take a step back and look at the bigger risk that we have in the region, which is uh, in this area south of Reykjavik. Um, and then I think, let's see, I think that's it for my update for today. I'm going to pull over my little uh, document here for some Q&A. And so again, these are questions that folks asked 
during the live stream yesterday that I was unable to get to. So I wanted to make sure that I could address these for those that asked. So from Steffi, she asks how basalt columns, columnar joints are created, uh, especially their hexagonal shape. And to illustrate that, I've actually got a, a diagram that I've um, had a graphic designer, Chelsea McRaven Feeney, shout out to her. She's illustrated some of the, the books I've written for Mountain Press on Idaho geology. And she, I got her some, she's good at taking my hand-drawn lousy sketches and then um, illustrating them in a very effective way. So the idea here, and this is just with a lava flow, this is because I, I had a, specific field trip I was going on I wanted to show how those columns could be not just vertical but also horizontal or at some angle but the basic idea is the same if you have a lava flow that's cooling uniformly from top to bottom and it doesn't matter what kind of landscape it's moving over here I've got it moving over sort of a steep slope uh, and then filling in a depression but if you have lava that is uniform so let's say it's moving but then let's take the arrows out and assume that that lava has stopped flowing uh, and we allow it to start to cool and crystallize as it cools and begins to solidify we get fractures developing from the top and the bottom the bottom is in contact with the land which is very cool the top is in contact with the air which is very cool the interior is insulated so it stays hotter longer and so we get these incipient incipient fractures that develop above and below um, and then these can actually link up so assuming that it's cooling you know uniformly throughout then what you get over time is these fractures starting to propagate towards the center sometimes they link up with a, a, a fracture from the opposite side to form a through going fracture sometimes they're offset a little bit um, and that's how you end up with these 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 fractures and because of the way these fractures cool they're always a hundred if you look at them from the top down they're 120 degrees um, separated from each other and so if you have one fracture here another one here with an angle of 120 degrees another one over here at 120 if you keep doing that around the perimeter what you end up with is a hexagon and so that's how you can end up with those perfect uh, hexagon shapes occurring so hopefully that's helpful to you Steffi as a question uh, from Thomas N you say in a recent update that GBS data tells us there's no more uplift which could be because it can't stretch anymore and pressure is now building. Would increasing pressure not cause earthquakes as well? So the idea here, Thomas, is the pressure can cause earthquakes. It really depends on the properties of the rock that the pressure is on. If the rock is warm because of, there's magma, if that rock is either semi-molten or just warm slash hot, um, it may behave more elastically than if it's cold. If it's cold and you exert a stress on it, it's brittle and it will tend to break quite easily, right? Um, and the analogy I sometimes use, and it's a silly one, is if you take uh, a, a Snickers bar, a candy bar, and put it in the freezer, and then take it out and exert a stress on it, you can snap it in half, right? Even though it's made out of chocolate and caramel and all those yummy things. If you take another Snickers bar, though, and put it in your pocket and go run you know, go run outside in the middle of the summer uh, and exert that same stress on that candy bar. It's going to flow and bend without breaking. And rocks somewhat behave the same. They will break and create earthquakes if they're cold and brittle. Uh, they will deform and and move elastically or what we call ductally um, when they're warm and not produce earthquakes. And so there's that little bit of a difference there. So hopefully that makes sense. So really it's not, it, the pressure is important because the pressure can generate an earthquake, but you can have pressure or stress accumulating and not have earthquakes if you have the right thermal conditions for that. Uh, so for Mary T, she's wondering if it's possible yet for people to walk out on parts of this lava field. And she's referencing the December 18th lava field that I flew the drone over uh, on Monday. And so I would say, could you walk on it as a solid surface? Yes. So you could go out there and walk and not be at risk of like falling through, which is it kind of this, I don't know, maybe it's a Hollywood thing, but often I've taken people out to lava fields before and that's like people are worried that they're going to like 
sink into the lava and I'm like well first of all it, lava is like dense rock you're not going to sink no one's going to like disappear into the lava you're you're more buoyant than the lava right it's not like water where you even in water you don't totally sink right and in salt water you're very buoyant lava is is molten rock uh, and you're way less buoyant so even if you stepped on lava maybe you would depress it a few inches but you wouldn't necessarily sink but anyway her question's a good one um, so although you could walk out on that lava field it's still probably very very hot and we saw that as I flew the drone over it there was lots of outgassing um, and steam and a viewer sent me to illustrate this a bit better let's see if I can find it oh it's right here um, so I had a viewer send me uh, this picture here so this is of can I zoom in on this maybe that's as zoomed in as it's gonna go but you can see the number there and this is in Celsius so about 253 degrees and his red dot is pointing to the rock so he is here out at the 2021 eruption site and I think he sent the I think he took this I think it was two years later so this was this past year 2023 he goes out to the eruptive site and very close to the crack here uh, the rock is reading this temperature. Now realize that the, the entire lava surface is not one continuous or uniform temperature. You're going to have cracks where the heat is escaping and so those are going to be much hotter than other big slabs of lava that don't have the fractures or the cracks in them. And then to to show you even even a better one here, so now his little red dot, which you can hopefully make out just right there, now he's going to point his uh, thermometer at the actual fracture here where the heat's escaping and you can see the number there so almost 424 degrees Celsius right over that fracture there um, pretty impressive so the point is that the lava retains heat for a long time so could you walk around that lava field sure um, could you stand over one of these cracks that's still quite hot you probably feel the heat it could maybe burn your legs through your pants it might melt the the soles of your shoes um, but could you go out and walk on it yeah but you probably want to be kind of smart about it uh, and I'm sure that the public officials are not recommending anyone go out on it so to be perfectly clear it is not a good idea and I am not recommending that anyone go walk out on the December 18th lava field I would wait a lot longer <laughs> before I would do that uh, Mr. Muppet fan does the uplift I'm assuming he's talking about the GPS uplift plateauing suggests the magma will pressurize further or move laterally yeah so remember on Monday when we did our our live stream and the Q&A we were looking at that smart singy GPS uh, graph and things were starting to plateau or flatten out a little bit um, and he's absolutely correct that that could that could have meant based on that data that the magma will inc increasingly pressurize without pushing the surface up or it could push into some lateral location east east west north south um, it's just going to take whatever the easiest path is if it's easier for the magma to move to the west it's going to move to the west if it's easier for the magma to inflate that zone above the sill or the magma body and push the ground up it's going to do that it's just a matter of what's the most efficient thing to do uh, jeffrey porter how long before plant life starts growing on a new lava field after cooling I don't know a lot about that, Jeffrey. Um, it's a great question. Depends a lot on the climate you're in. If we're in a place like Hawaii, you can see plant life coming back um, within a few years of an eruption because they have so much rainfall. It's a tropical climate. In a place like Iceland, um, the first thing you're going to see are the lichens and the moss coming back. Uh, but it probably takes well, they have a very wet climate too. I would guess it takes several years to decades to really start to establish those colonizing species on an active lava field. Um, but I'm sure there's been some great biological or ecological studies that have that have looked at that. Uh, from Carl Furstenberg, is the magma connected all the way down to the mantle? Um, in Iceland in general, yes. And I pulled up, this is a paper I just found and let's see if I can pull it up here. Where is it? Um, oh, here we go. It's not the best graphic, but I hope it'll work. And it's it's more confusing than what I wanted, but hopefully 
So this will work okay. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so the idea here is this is a cross section, um, and this is basically a cross section from more or less this ice cap here, so the largest ice cap um, in Iceland, all the way across this region here. So more or less through the middle of Iceland, not quite on an east-west line, but pretty close. Um, and so what you can see here is this is where the hotspot is um, touching or um, contacting the lower part of the crust, is over here beneath that big glacier or at Afiyoko. Um, so that's where the hotspot is, but we think that there's little sort of tendrils of the hotspot. They get dragged because the plates are moving. And so there's little zones where the hotspot magma rises and infiltrates part of the crust of Iceland and then feeds some of these other volcanoes. So the ERZ is the Eastern Rift Zone. This is the, the WRZ is the Western Rift Zone. This paper talks about how, and I haven't read it, I just read the abstract, but how, wh why we have different magma types in parts of Iceland. So even though in the Reykjanes Peninsula, the place we're looking at, it's all basalt, as you get into other parts of Iceland in the central part, you do get some other rock types or magma types like rhyolite and, and some other um, compositions. And so they, they're relating that to rifting and a little chunk of Greenland that got dragged over with Iceland and that's providing the uh, continental crust contaminant that's creating these other magma compositions. But to answer your question, um, which now I need to make sure I got, yes the magma is definitely connected down to the mantle. We can also see that in some of the geochemistry uh, th th there as well. And so the magma, whether it's from the divergent plate boundary or the hot spot, that magma is connected to a deeper source. If it's the hot spot, it's a very deep source, but even if it's the divergent plate boundary, it's still connected to uh, the mantle. That's where the magma is originating, is in the mantle, and then it's rising into these shallow uh, chambers below the ground. Uh, from SFOS, would you ever consider leading a geology tour in Iceland for ordinary folks? Well, I am doing that this year. I think it's pretty much full. It's a small trip of eight people in May, but assuming it goes well, and I anticipate it will, I'll probably do another one next year. Um, so if you're interested in coming to Iceland with me and seeing all the sites, maybe seeing an eruption if one's taking place, uh, look for some announcements coming out soon. So yeah, I've taken people in the past. I've taken student groups before, and I'll be doing that this May. From Craigster, does the 2023 lava that are, has erupted have the same characteristics as the 2020-21 eruptive lava. Thank you for everything. Take care. Thanks, Craigster. Um, yeah, largely it's the same rock type. Broadly, it's the same composition. But if you get down into the nitty-gritty details, there are some tiny subtle differences. And there's some papers out. I can see if I can try to find some that talk about that. The 2021 eruption had some different crystals in it that had spent a lot more time in the subsurface because we didn't have an eruption in this area prior to that at least you know in the last what, what 500 years 800 years whatever um, and subsequent eruptions have had maybe less of that component to them and so broadly does you know if you picked up two rocks from both of these eruptions and held them side by side they're identical they look pretty much the same but in the chemistry and then the details uh, there's some small differences there and then our last question, Matt Smith wants to know, can you explain how an island like Iceland can span plates? I don't understand the relationship between landforms and the underlying plates. Um, yeah, so it's a divergent plate boundary. So it's similar to these, these mid-ocean ridges we have out here in the ocean. Uh, but the difference in Iceland is so much lava has erupted onto the surface that it's actually built up land above sea level. So it's really no different. Uh, these mid-ocean ridges or divergent boundaries out here in the ocean, they also generate uh, lava. They have volcanic eruptions all the time. It's just that they're underneath 10,000 feet of water. They're under tremendous pressure. 
we don't see them there's no surface manifestation of them we might get a few earthquakes but they don't impact humanity no one's living there and so they largely go unnoticed and unchecked um, iceland of course is a continent a country and so its volcanic activity is much more noticeable and impactful as we're seeing uh, these last few months um, so it spans plates because every time that lava comes up through the divergent plate boundary and spills out onto the land uh, it puts some lava on one plate and some on the other then the plates move apart a little bit then there's another eruption that spills out more lava that adds mass to each plate then they move apart and i know i'm super making this cartoonish and and simplified but that's overall uh, the idea there so uh, hopefully that was helpful thanks for those questions folks um, we might do another live stream soon maybe with the drone maybe not obviously if something big happens i'll try to get back to you as quick as i can i do start back here at the college on monday so my my time and bandwidth is going to decrease a little bit but i promise to still continue to provide updates as we kind of monitor this situation together um, i'm going to be interested in it so if i'm interested and i'm diving into the science and what's happening it makes sense for me to take a few minutes and put together these videos so that you can um, learn as well along with me. So I appreciate your time. Appreciate you learning with me. Hopefully this was helpful and useful. Um, appreciate all your comments and support to the channel. Very helpful and meaningful to me. Helps me put these together uh, and, and focus a little bit of my energy in this arena. So take care, be well, and we'll see you soon.